Good morning. I'm thrilled that there are so many of you here for an 8.30 a.m. session on the Friday of the conference. So I really appreciate everyone waking up early and coming out here. My name is Leila Driscoll. I work on the .NET Common Language Runtime. So I'm on the CLR team. We'll be covering a pretty broad section of .NET today and some of the features from my team that I've worked on as well. We'll spend a little bit of time covering some context just to make sure we're all on the same page, but most of the talk will be doing one of two things. So the first portion, we will be building an app, and we will actually be using a broad range of new .NET features to build up an app all about .NET. And then the later part of the talk, we will actually play with that app and check out some of the other .NET features. So to just set some context at the very beginning where we're coming from, there's kind of two pieces that we're hearing a lot about. And so one is what we're hearing from users of apps written in .NET. And one big one, of course, is business compatibility. So the ability to run with existing apps, run with the infrastructure that your businesses have already today. The other thing that has become very popular, especially with the consumer of IT is really having that fast and fluid experience. So quick apps, quick access to everything, which leads to the third big thing that we hear about, which is connected apps. This expectation that your app is with you everywhere and you have access to all of your information that's in the cloud or some shared service somewhere. And then the big three platforms that we spend a lot of time thinking about that I hope you do as well, the new Windows 8 platform, web and cloud, and then also the phone. And so bringing these together, you have a great experience um, with .NET. And so what we've done with .NET 4.5 is really build it with these aspects in mind. So as we go through, you'll see places where each of these things come up as, as key areas. And we are really done with the, the majority of the slide portion. I just want to walk through a little bit of the design of the app before we start building it. So this is my hand drawing sketch of the app that we will be building. So this first portion down here is essentially a grid layout that we will use that has different .NET features. So I don't know if anybody can recognize right here this spatial data. Does anyone recognize where that hand drawing location is? It's my attempt to be here, but perhaps not. Then each of these little tiles that we have that represent .NET features will have a second page that you can jump into to get more information and potentially make it into a ratings app. And then this third page that you see, is this one over here, is an optional page that some of them will have with additional information, for example, code, which typically you wouldn't handwrite async code, but with the new async work in 4.5, it's actually possible, not that you would want to. And then here's just a high level look at what the architecture is going to be in the app that we're building. So we'll use Entity Framework code first to build up our backend database. And then we'll use the new web API to interact and get that data. And we'll use the new async and await keywords and language functionality to download all of these different tiles and images that we have in an asynchronous fashion. And we'll build this as a new Windows 8 app. What I have so far here is just a blank solution with a little bit of a starter app here for us to just have the UI built up first. Obviously, this is just placeholders for the different pieces of it. And if we look at it, this matches at least fairly closely to what we just looked at in the drawing. So this is just dummy data in there for now, and we'll go and fix that. So you have your icon, a little bit of an introduction, and then potentially an image to jump into. If there's no image, like I said, that's an optional piece. It'll look closer to this. And then if we don't have any data, we'll show this icon until we stop searching for it. So 
So let's build the rest of this. We will start by adding a new project and we'll add a new MVC4 application and we'll call this our web backend. And this is going to have all of the backend server infrastructure that holds our data that we interact with. As I said, we're using Web API, so we're not using this portion to create the front end or a website, but we're doing it just for the back end. So we'll create this as a Web API. And this will be an MVC, so we'll be creating both the model portion of it and then the controller portion as well. That one. And uh, the .NET catalog piece that we just looked at, we'll be able to look at a little bit in more detail, but the way that it's built up is really just the same XAML that you're familiar with. And it's adding in a few things. One interesting thing about the MVC4 app that we're, um, project that we're adding, is it includes Entity Framework for you, so that's going to be there. Now it opens up with this default just values controller that is there to show you how it works and what's, what's available to you. To just briefly take a look at it, we'll see that it uses the exact same verbs that you would be expecting from the HTTP protocol. So you have get, post, all of these verbs that really interact directly with that layer. We don't actually need this controller, so we'll go ahead and delete that now. And let's start by creating a new model. And all we'll do is simply add a new class for this. This is going to be where we add in essentially what will become our schema. And we'll just make that our feature. So this will describe all of the information that we have for each of those tiles that we're going to represent. So instead of you watching me type all of it, um, we'll go ahead and enter some of these very simply. So what we've done is we've created the basic properties to represent this feature. We have an ID, which we'll need. We have the name of the feature the description, which will be on that more detailed page, the version number. Um, if you notice, there were a few different colored features in the app when we looked through it briefly. What we'll do in this is each different feature, ver each version that we have, will represent with a different color so we can see what version it was added to .NET. And then we have the icon, which is on the front page and then on the dive-in page. And we also have the additional image that we can dive into with extra information. And both of those we're storing just as a byte array and we'll deserialize later. Now let's go in and create a controller. And this will be to get all of our features. And so that's what we will call it. almost fast enough for water. And this is just an empty API controller again because we're doing the UI portion. The first thing that we need to do is we actually have to have access to our model that we just created. For now, so we will not use this the entire time, but we'll start out just by creating some dummy data just to make sure and see what we're creating here. The next thing that we will do is we'll create one of those gets so we can actually get the information that we want from this controller. Oops. And you notice that I named it get, and it's actually very important that it has get at the beginning because that's the way that it will interact and it will look for that. The nice thing is it doesn't have to be called just get. 
you can actually rename it to whatever you would like um, for, for that purpose. Now let's take a look and see, oops, actually going to stop that because for now we actually want to look at just this new portion that we have. So what we'll do is set this as our startup project so we can actually look at this piece on its own. Run this again. And you notice that we're, we're running to localhost and it's just working. I actually don't have SQL Express so I'll show you how this is working in just a moment. And so I'm appending on this API feature. So since we're doing a, um, an API, that's why it has API there. And then features is the name of our controller. And so opening this up, you'll notice that we have this dummy day that, that we just created. So we have the garbage collection and link. And the reason it looks in this shape and it's returning JSON is simply because I have IE as my browser. If I was connected to Firefox, it would be in XML. And so whichever the format is that, it's requ that it requests when it calls that get is the format that we'll have. And so we'll continue to use JSON for the dur duration of this. And if we actually just take a look here what's going on at this web config, Pretty big. But. Notice this local DB right here. This is something brand new and it was really designed with developers in mind. So typically if you use SQL Express, it's designed for a small company. So it has all of the added database functionality that you would expect and need to run that but then it's very limited. So it's for a smaller database. You don't necessarily have the richness and the size. LocalDB, on the other hand, you can have up to a 10 gig database and you don't actually have the extra portion of it around configuring the database from the other portion of it. So it's designed for developers. If you already have SQL Express installed, it'll just continue to use that. So it won't change it under the covers for you. But if you don't have SQL Express, you will get LocalDB automatically and it's there for you. We can close that. Now, if we come back over here, so, so far we've just been able to get all of the features. What if we want to get just one feature? So I've done two things here. So one, we're taking just an ID that we're given and we're returning that single feature. And that's just in this first portion right here. The next thing is that you have full control over the HTTP response and can actually interact with that. So all we've done is we've created a new response for the not found. If we give an ID that we don't actually have in our data, we want to be able to give an interesting response. And instead of just not found, it would be nice to say that the feature is not found. And I'm going to run this without um, being under the debugger so we don't see the error there. And I'm also going to turn on the developer tools in IE simply by hitting F12. And if I come to this network portion and I start my capture before we go over there, first let's get one that we do know we have. So features and we'll just depend on a one. And open that up and garbage collection. So that was our first one with ID one that we had and so that's what we get back. Now we didn't have three so if we try three what we get is this 404 and if we go into the details right here you'll see that we have feature not found. So with that just simple little bit that's already there for you to interact with, you can work directly with HTTP. And that's one of the benefits of using Web API. 
So if you're working on many different protocols and you need that abstraction layer, then WCF is fantastic for it. But if you know that you're just using a RESTful interaction model, you can actually use Web API and have that full richness of the protocol. Let's see. So, so far we've just been interacting with dummy data. So let's switch over and start using Entity Framework and actually create a real database backend. So the first thing that we need to do is, well, if we didn't have Entity Framework, the place that you would get it from is through NuGet. And we'll be able to see that I already have it installed. The reason why I have it installed is actually because when we created that MVC4 um, project, it automatically brings the new entity framework down. And you'll notice that we're using the pre-release, so we're using and getting all of the, the new aspects of it. The first thing is we'll actually um, include this so that we can access it. And the next thing that we will do is create our repository. So this feature context, it's simply just a way to be able to set up one access to the database and be able to access it from multiple controllers in an easy way. And right now we only have one controller, but in a moment we'll be creating a second controller, so we want one access point to that. And if we come back over to our existing controller, we want to get rid of this dummy data. So we'll just delete that completely. And we will add in first access to this repository. So that's the, the static repository that we just created. And then the next thing that we will add is again some dummy data because we're not quite ready to load in our real data yet. And all we're doing here, and let me actually change this from link, because we had link before, so that won't be fair to look at that. And we're simply adding one thing, and then we save our changes, and that's the way that it'll actually um, get into the database. Oops. Ah, of course. Um, so we just changed and are actually using this um, repository, like I said, and so instead of using this dummy array, let's fix this up here. And we'll just simply change this to the features, which is to access our features that are in that database that we're creating. And we'll run this. Get rid of the, this tools. And now this time it's going to take a little bit longer because what we're doing this first time that we access it is when the database is created. So at this moment it's creating the database and it's creating the schema based on what we did in our model. And so now we have our new data that's coming from that database and actually in what we created from Entity Framework. So, so far we've only used Entity Framework in the way that exists today, which is using the code first model to do that. And now let's actually use something that's new. We don't need more dummy data. Um, so let's come into features and so far we have all of this interesting information, but if we wanted to turn this into a ratings app and we wanted to add one more bit of data to our database. Does anybody actually think this will just work? You think so? I have a few nods.
and it won't work. And the reason why it won't work is because just randomly changing the schema of your database is not something that typically happens just by adding a property. Um, it might be a little bit unfortunate if that was the level of control. But we can actually very easily do it with something that is new to Entity Framework, which are the Entity Framework migrations. So we'll use the Package Manager console, which I have open, but I'll show you where to get it instead. If you just go into the Library Package Manager, you have this Package Manager console. And it works a lot like PowerShell, but it's integrated in here. And so what we will do is first enable migrations. And we do need to specify the project name since I have multiple projects in here and don't actually have it hooked up to the UI portion. And so at this point, all we're doing is enabling migrations to work. We're not actually making um, any changes to the database or to our schema yet. But if we look over here, it has created, and I can zoom in here, it has created this series of numbers, which is just a timestamp, and then this initial um, marker of what, where our database is right now in case you want to roll back, and then this configuration to be able to configure our, our migrations. That is giant. And before we actually make any changes to this, I do want to show you the data first. So I have the SQL um, object explorer, which you can just get under the view menu right there. And what we have is a view of what our databases are. And so to see that it truly is in database form, we can look under this web backend model, which is what we just created, and open up the tables, and then we can look at what data is actually in there. There we go. And so as we just saw through the JSON, we have it there, but it's also in database form. And you'll notice we don't have any rating section. If we come back over to our package manager console, let's add a migration. Now, I'm calling it add ratings, but that's, I'm simply giving it a name so that when I go back, I can look at what was this migration about, what was the point of it. It's not actually making any changes yet. What it's done is it has created a new migration path for it. So that's where our updates will go. Now we're going to actually update the database. I'm going to add on this verbose flag. And the nice thing about what adding that is, is it will show you the exact SQL that it's running. So you don't have that hidden from you that you don't have access to again. So we have the exact SQL that was run to make this update. Oh, actually, I wanted to add one more thing. Let's see if that will. So I've never tried this. So if it doesn't work, just ignore that I'm doing this. Um, we'll see if it updates and makes that change at all. So if we come over to our data again and we refresh, we will see that we get our rating added. And so we do have that rating now that has been added on this other column. So far, we still have just one entry, and it would be really nice to have more information. So we're going to actually add in that additional information. So if we go in here into our configuration. So we mentioned that this was created before. One nice thing that's there is it's called a seed method. 
And this seed method will get run every time you update the database. Last time we didn't have anything in here, so nothing happened. We're going to add something here, and this time I'm intentionally putting a huge chunk of code that I'm not going to show you because it's just ugly code parsing um, a text file. See, long, ugly. But what we'll do is we'll come back in here. We don't need the verbose. It's not doing anything for us. And we'll run this update again. And so we have no change to actually make on the database, but it ran this seed method. It's running this seed method. And actually, it will not work because we need to copy one thing over. So I'm going to open our project and actually put the information over there. Just open this up and explore. And I have this just web assets, which is a container of all of the images and the content in that. And I'll put it into the folder for our web backend, which we created um, while we've been here. And we will run this one more time. And it'll take a moment longer running the seed method this time because it's actually running that method that it does. So let's look and see, do we have data? We'll come back over to our database. And there we go. We, so we have all of our data in our database, um, and we're pretty good to go, except for the fact that if we continue to use the same get methods that we had before, we're going to be pulling a lot of data over the wire, especially if we want to grab all of the features to load up in that front grid. It's a lot of inf We have these big images, so that's probably not the best way to do this. So now we're going to actually create that second controller that I mentioned. And this will be our summary controller. So we'll come in, we'll add another controller. And this one, we'll just add on summary to the naming of it. We need to be able to access our model again. And we'll do a few similar things. So first, we will create that exact same access to that repository. So it's the same one. We don't have a separate instance of the database. Oops. And the first thing that we want to do is let's just get the, the list of IDs so we know what's in there. And we'll just get back, because that's simple, easy to do. We can get everything there. And then at the same time, we can order those IDs in a useful order instead of just random adding them in there. So first, we'll add them by version. And we'll put all of the new things first so that we can look at the new things. And then we'll put them in alphabetical order just so it's easy to look through. And this is just you know a simple getting each one and ordering it. The next one that we'll do is actually pull down just the bits of information for the summary page that we really need. And we can do that by ID. And one of the reasons why we're doing this separately instead of getting just this information in that first one, since we need it, is that now when we get it from the app, we can use asynchronous calls and we can get all of this information individually instead of just waiting for everything to download. And so we're simply just selecting the, um, the feature for the ID. And this time, we know, since we're just checking the ID, that we'll have the list. So we won't go through um, and do any of the error handling here. And then we'll just get the ID, the name, and the icon, because that's what represents our front page that we're creating. And we can, of course, take a look at this and watch it work as well. This time, of course, we're accessing the feature summary. And we have our list of IDs. And while we're not 100% sure by looking at those, because I don't have them memorized, that they're in the right order, 
the fact that they're not in numerical order gives us a good um, trust point, and we can look at those later. They have them there. Let's see. And now we're ready to link it up to our UI front end. So we'll set this back as our startup project, how we had it originally. And we also want to add in this project dependency to this web backend that we've just created. And so just to take a look at some of what we have here. Oops. You can get a glimpse that it's really very similar XAML to, to what you have. Now the first thing that we want to do is make sure that we have all of the libraries that we have. And so one of them is going to be that we're going to use the HTTP client to get this. The other thing that we need is we need a way to deserialize that data that we've stored as a byte array. And so we're going to use JSON to do that. And I believe I already have it because I was worried about the network. Let's check if I actually have it. Oh, yes, I do already have it installed. So this did not already happen to be installed with something else um, by creating the project. And I went and downloaded this from NuGet myself ahead of time. Uh, which if I trusted the network, we would have done right now. And now we'll just reference that. And one nice thing about this, and I don't know if it's obvious, but that's actually a third party um, uh, JSON library that anybody can put it up in NuGet, and it happens to be one that I know works really well and, and is efficient, so we're going to go ahead and use that. Let me find. And, uh, let me just make sure and get us to the right um, file here. And we just did that in the wrong file. We'll come into this features data source, and I'll add that back in there. One thing that's also really nice is that in the new Windows 8 applications, there's a few new um, kind of starter templates that you can start from and things that you can use as base classes. And one is this bindable base. And it makes it easier to bind and interact with the iNotify property um, change information. And so here you can see that we're binding to each of these different items that we had created before. We'll come back to this get more information later. So this initialize, we'll hide this. It's just the hard coding of those five icons that we saw earlier. And we'll come in here and we'll kind of create this interaction. Oops. And so this first piece, what we're starting to do is we're using the HTTP client. And then I've set the max response to a much larger size. I'm not sure the, I think it's um, 64K that it's set to originally, just to make sure that you have kind of a reasonable size amount of information that you're putting across the wire, unless you're deliberate about it. And so we're upping this so that we can pass those larger images that we have. And then what I have partially started here is we're using this await keyword, which is going to allow us to get this information asynchronously. And then we need to get it from this local host that we've been using. So I'll come over to our web backend and our properties. And um, if you haven't used this, this is where you can come and get what that, what that string is to access your local host, because it will change with each project. And then we want to access this summary page that we've been doing. And
And you'll notice that the await is red squiggly, unhappy, not going to do anything wonderful for us. And we have to make one other change, which is to make this an async call. And so anytime you're awaiting anything, you need this async. So to take a step back and just kind of think about what's going on here, this is the new has, have most people heard about async and await while you've been here or before? I have some nods. Lots of, oh, wonderful. It's, it's a loved and known feature. So for those of you who are like, oh, God, what I, have I missed out? Um, I'm sure you can watch some of the deep talks on it. But essentially what we're doing by having this await keyword is we're able to make this call, and regardless of how long it takes to to run, we're returned a task that wraps up the rest of the function in that task, and then we'll run it after whatever we're awaiting happens. And so to do that, because it's changing the return type to a task and doing some interesting things, you have to put the async keyword and make that method async. Um, typically, when you use this pattern, you'll be returning a task. We're at kind of the top level of the call, and so it's just a void. Um, but more often, you'd have the task so you can interact with it and actually um, cancel and see progress. And we'll do one other thing because it's convention, and we'll rename this. as soon as my machine becomes responsive. Not sure what that is. Okay. And so by convention, you name your method ending with async, so it's very obvious to anybody that's using it. And then the one other piece that we want to add in here is actually doing this deserialization that we mentioned. And so we're just using this json.net that we got from NuGet, and we're using this convert and able to deserialize the response that we have that we get from this um, summaries information. And then we'll go through, as we talked about, and get that information also asynchronously as opposed to waiting for all of our images to come down. Let's see if I still have it there. I do. And so we'll just add in that local host once again so that we can access it. And then we're just going through each um, ID as we get it. We'll deserialize it again. And then we'll just add that so that we actually can see it from our UI. So let's see where we are with this. As you saw, they kind of sprinkled in as they came, and so that's really showing off that ability to download all of these things individually as we were talking about. And now we have that, but we don't actually have the rest of the image because we've only brought across the wire what we needed for that front page of it. So we have one more little piece to add. We come over here, and now we'll go into our items page and see that to be able to load that page, we call this get more information. And right now it's blank. So let's add that piece in. And again, we're using an, uh, an await call to get that larger optional image if it's there. So we need to come in here, make this async, and we'll rename this method to get more info async. This one doesn't have an image, so we, let's grab one that does just to make sure. So we have all of our information. So we have now, in just a portion of the talk, 
We have built up our app using Entity Framework, New Web API, the HTTP client, um, and using async to build this up and connect to a Metro-style front end to be able to interact with that. And all of the UI was built in a very similar XAML to what you're used to with WPF or Silverlight or phone, very similar experience to building that. Since I'm on the .NET side, I don't usually um, show UI work as much. Now we're at the point where I'm going to go through and talk about different features that are across .NET and that may not have fit well into the other part of the app. So first of all, are most of you familiar with doing the new web, uh, the new uh, Windows 8 development? A few nods. Not as many as async? Okay. So one thing that's I think phenomenal and a huge just changed everything. I think there's a lot of excitement about the new UI and the slates and the form factor and that's all wonderful. But one thing from my side that is really exceptional is WinRT. And if you aren't familiar with WinRT, it is really just a beautiful way to do interop. So if you're used to doing P invoke and com, it's just it's painful. It's a more advanced way to interact. There's a lot of room for error. And as tons of APIs are written at the Windows layer, you never know when someone's going to add some wrapper for you that you can use. And it's just always been an advanced thing to interop um, and interact from managed into native um, and into Windows APIs. And so with WinRT, what you have the ability to do for the first time is interact with Windows as if it's managed code. I, when you're actually interacting with it, it can be very easy to just not even realize that you're interacting with Windows. And so on the side with the red boxes is just like the very beginning of what you would have to do with your DLL imports and handling all of the loading and p-invoking in and handling the marshalling of all of your types. And that goes on much longer. It just wouldn't have fit on the slide without being impossible to read. And now it's very simple. You reference, you notice that you have this Windows as your namespace, which is your biggest clue that you're actually interacting with Windows. And then everything else feels just as you're used to as a managed developer. The APIs are nice and clean, and interacting with it, the types are actually, in most cases, the exact same. So we have a few things like string where we do some special things under the cover to kind of map those, but the rest really are the same types. And it goes so far that the way that WinRT types are created are by writing what are called .winmd files. It essentially holds a bunch of metadata, and the metadata is almost identical to the metadata that we've had in the CLR for this whole time. And so it's a very natural flow. Things work very well with it. And it's just a natural fit writing managed code for Windows. And so I'm going to go through and try and get through most of these. And I'll probably focus on some of the ones that are my favorites. But if you see something that like, I'm not giving enough attention to, just like raise your hand and shout. And, and uh, we can talk about that one a bit more. Um, and the other thing that I just want to mention up front is I, since I am from the CLR team, I know the things that are closer to the core of .NET more. And so some of the higher libraries, I don't have listed out everything new that they've done. They've done amazing things across the board. And I've just kind of picked some of the ones that I know for me seem really interested in and I'm excited about. Um, and so like for the ADO.NET, um, this is just the one thing that I pulled out of their long list, which is they've now added the ability to do your um, encryption in memory. So you never actually have to store it on disk before um, adding that level of security if that's a priority for you. Um, ARM processor support, this is, I think, really a big deal, um, primarily because it's so simple. So if you are writing one of these new Windows 8 apps, and you don't specify just a specific platform, but you pick the, the very obvious, any CPU prefer 32-bit? Yeah, whichever one gets you all of them. I know it's uh, strange naming. Um, it'll automatically run on ARM. You don't have to do anything special. 
So Windows has done a lot to abstract away some of the differences, and then we've done some other things to abstract away anything else that can make it a different environment. So you absolutely don't need to know anything different. Um, for those of you that are interested, I will give you kind of one of the edge case things that you're probably not likely to run into doing um, a Windows 8 app, but you might. Um, so if you don't care, cover your ears. Otherwise, we'll go into geek mode for a moment. Um, so the x86 processor has a really strong memory model, and the ARM has a really weak memory model. Don't get confused and think that it's like any less awesome for being weak. Um, just to explain briefly, the memory model is essentially just a way to communicate when you're running uh, multiple threads and accessing that shared memory. It's kind of the way that it guarantees that things will happen correctly. And if you just keep everything and you run everything in order, of course it's going to be correct and run in the correct order, but you can't necessarily take advantage of the fact that certain registers are open that you can actually run something that's later in line earlier. And if you think about how ARM is developed, it really is targeted for having really great power and being lightweight and all of these very mobile, mobile aspects of it, which means that they can't just add in really high power crazy components because those are more likely to drain the battery. And so they look for efficiency in other ways. And one way is by having a, what's called a weak memory model, meaning they do more um, instruction reordering, which gives them the ability to get extra performance tweaks based on using any, um, any register that's open at that moment that they can use it. And generally, um, this won't affect you anyway. The way that the CLR was designed was designed for a weak memory model. Um, but it just hasn't really mattered. And so the only place that you'll run into this is if you are doing lock-free um, algorithms for your shared memory, you actually have to use the volatile keyword. And so it's always been documented that you're supposed to use the volatile keyword, um, but running on the Intel platforms, it just didn't matter. And so your code is probably perfectly right, and there's a small chance that you're doing that. But if you are doing lock-free programming and not using Volatile, I'm happy to chat with you later. Um, and we can talk about that. So otherwise, for everybody else, there's really very little to know about or think about, and you just magically get to target a whole new platform um, and have kind of that just covered automatically for you. Um, one thing I'll mention, I actually have two kind of slides talking about user voice a little bit. How many of you are familiar with user voice? I know a few people, okay, very few hands. Okay, so user voice is a website, and you can go to um, visualstudio.uservoice.com, and it allows you to add feature requests that you want, and then you can also vote on them. And so we can get information when we're in the product team and see what you care about most. And ASP.NET is actually one of the teams that really used this in this current release as a way to drive what features they did. And it doesn't mean that they do everything that's popular, but it gives us a way to reprioritize when we know that something's really important to you that maybe we didn't know. And so... ASP.NET, they actually fixed over 20 of the top 25 requests that they had on user voice. Um, I won't go through all of those, but if, if that's something you care about, um, I would definitely check out the site, or you can also look at any of their talks. Um, we talked about async and await um, a bit. We can talk more about that um, offline if you have questions. So background server GC. How many of you use the server GC mode? A couple. How many of you know that there is a server GC? Okay, so a few more hands, but not everybody. So are people interested in the garbage collector? Are you cool if I just spend a few minutes kind of explaining how it really works? I think there's some confusion often. So just to kind of set the first bit of context, the way our garbage collector is designed is it's generational. And so we have Gen 0, and technically there's a Gen 1, and then a Gen 2. You don't have to know all of these details, but kind of get the concept of it. 
So the model that we look at is that when you allocate some object, it's likely to either be very short-lived, so it's only going to be around for a little while, or it's likely that you've created it probably at the very beginning and it's going to last for the whole application. Not everything, but most things fall into those two buckets. And so when we allocate something, so the only time you ever interact and end up having garbage collections is because you're allocating things. So if you either knew, knew something up or if its value type gets boxed. And when that happens, we essentially have this generation zero, which is kind of small, ready for you to just allocate and create objects on. And so it's really quick, if the memory's there, really quick to create a new object. And then when we come through and we do a Gen Zero collection, we can collect anything that's one of those short-lived items. And it's gone and it clears up and you have more space. And so briefly, Gen 1 is not particularly important to care about. It's kind of like a second Gen Zero that's just in case you created that object like right before the garbage collector kicked in and like you're about to go away, but you missed that point. And so it's really just a second chance to get rid of that object early. And so both Gen 0 and Gen 1 are really small, really fast to collect. I promise you're not going to hit any pause times on Gen 0 that you're going to care about. You're just not going to notice it. And then there's Generation 2. So if you've lived through these first collections, that means you're moved into the big space of the heap. And when we collect the Gen 2 collection, that's the one that you, if you hear about that there's pauses, it's because of a Gen 2 collection. Because we have to go through the whole heap and we have to mark and see what's there and compact it and move it around. And so at this point, I'm kind of talking about the basic kind of client side version, but it's fairly similar to the server. And so one difference with the server GC, just as it is, even before 4.5, is that we actually, instead of having one giant heap, we have a heap per core. And that just means that you're able to do these in smaller pieces instead of having one heap for um, your entire server app. When we get into background, so the other portion of server is that it's primarily designed with throughput in mind. And so just how quickly can you get through that as possible? Whereas the client GC is focused on latency typically, and so interaction. And it's just designed slightly differently to work that way. It doesn't matter what kind of machine you're running on. You get client by default, and you opt into um, server. I can actually jump into this, and, and you can. That first um, GC server enable true in your config file is how you turn on server GC. And so just by doing that, you get some benefit if having multiple heap help, heaps help you. So for client GC, we always cared about latency, and so we added background server GC, which what it means is that instead of when you go and do a Gen 2 collection, pausing the world and kind of getting through it, that you're actually able to do that collection, run your app at the same time, and continue to do Gen Zero collections so you don't run out of space. There are moments of pausing. So there's just parts of garbage collection that you have to pause things for when you're moving around and compacting and moving pointers. Crazy things would happen if you didn't. So we do have little moments of pausing, but not for the entire time. And for the first time in 4.5, we've actually brought background server GC um, brought in background to server GC so that you have that benefit of for a little bit of, of throughput for that individual GC, you can actually continue to run your app. And so primarily it's to cater to apps that, are, that need to be closer to a real time and also just better utilization of resources. This chart um, is not labeled, but it's actually from a Bing blog post that just came out recently. So they've already started to use .NET 4.5 and right here at this point where the chart drops down um, is when they started using background server GC. And this is tracking the amount of time that they spent um, in the GC. And so it was a significant benefit for them. They actually wrote a whole thing on it, which is awesome to read. At least for me, working on the team that does that, it seemed awesome. <laughs> Maybe not everybody thinks like leisure fun reading is about the benefits of the garbage collector. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, so a few of these I'll just touch on briefly and not dive in too much. Um, so one, as it says, um, Consul, after all these years, uh, finally supports Unicode. Um, so even in Consul, there's, there's improvements. Entity Framework has added uh, Enum support all the way through um, the different aspects of Entity Framework, whether it's code first um, or coming from the database side, and you can pl plumb that in. Um, and that was something that was really done because of user request, and so they've definitely um, listened. One thing, I mentioned this during the demo, but just to kind of make sure that they got it. So Entity Framework now actually ships through NuGet. So the way that you get it is as a separate um, install through NuGet. And the reason why that's done is because there's just a lot that they want to do and they want to move at a faster cadence. And so with the popularity of NuGet, it really is beneficial for us to be able to leverage it. Um, in addition to having third-party libraries add-on, we can also use that as a really smooth, easy way that everyone's familiar with of getting getting additional parts of the framework. Um, the spatial data, so there's actually, essentially it's for anything with coordinates, but the two main things are both geographic and geometric. And so if it's uh, geographic, it takes into account that like we live on a round planet and will help with that math and then also does geometric work. Um, and so that's really beneficial, anything with coordinates. Um, table valued um, functions, so it doesn't work with code first, um, but uh, it allows you to return the return type of your function to actually be a table shaped value. Um, ASP.NET um, performance improvements, the really great thing about this is you don't have to do anything to get them. If you start running on 4.5, you just automatically get these benefits. And so there were a few things that they did to improve working set. And then the other two like big things that were done, one is taking advantage of the prefetcher in server 2012. And then the other thing is actually um, something that they worked with uh, my team to do, which I'll kind of jump to this one and talk to a little bit, which is multi-core JIT. So I'm just going to briefly, so I have a JIT. Let me make this small for a second so everyone's eyes don't focus on that. So there's really two ways if you're running managed code. So one, you can have it JIT, meaning that it actually compiles down to bytecode on that client machine at runtime. Or you can use NGEN and precompile it. Does anybody use NGEN in here? OK, cool. So I'll definitely cover another feature in a moment. Um, and so. When you're jitting, one of the benefits of doing that is that you only compile what you need, which means that you don't bloat your working set and you just only spend time compiling what you need and don't have any wasted compilation. The downside is that if you don't know what you need to compile until when you need to compile it, you can't actually do that on multiple cores. And so we've added this feature called multi-core JIT which allows you to specify the beginning of your app startup. You can actually do this in other places. Um, and as you can see, there's things that have to be done. Um, before I kind of explain how you do it on your own, ASP.NET and Silverlight 5 both saw this as so beneficial to the startup in both of those environments that they just baked it in. So you just automatically get this benefit under the cover when you use um, Silverlight 5 or ASP.NET. And what it does is it just has a little marker that says, hey, I'm starting up. And it has a file that it essentially writes down information that the JIT needs to know what methods are used. You don't even have to specify when startup ends. I can't begin to tell you how hard it is to look at an app and know exactly when startup has ended. Um, as an app developer, that's just a hard thing to do. And so what we do instead is we monitor the resources and watch when they level back out and go into an idle state. And we use that as our indication that we have finished startup. So we write that information. And then the next time that app launches, we're able to know what we need to be jitting. And so we can have multiple threads running the JIT and actually compiling your code faster. And so. That's something that, and it's 
really simple. This is really all you have to do if you want to add it either into another part of your app. So for example, if there's some um, button that launches into another part of an app or some other piece of it that you know takes a lot of time to kind of start up that second piece, you can simply add this. Um, you would set a different path to where your, that file is, and it's basically just giving access and a place that we can write something, and then you start it, and that's it. Now, I mentioned that InGen briefly, and so I know that not everybody uses InGen or knows what it is. What it is is it gives you the ability to pre-compile your app ahead of time and create an engine, a native image, essentially. And so you use a tool called engine.exe to do that. And the benefits include the fact that you don't have to JIT at all. It's startup. It's all already pre-compiled for you. And you're actually able to share code. So if it's library code that's used by multiple apps, that can actually be loaded into memory just once. The downsides is that you end up with a really big file. Um, because it precompiles everything that you need for your entire app. It's also the case that when you actually write your app and it compiles down, it doesn't typically end up in exactly the perfect ordering so that everything that you need at startup is at the top of the app. And so we have this new optimization um, that you can do to your engine image. And what you do is you engine it, so you run this the normal tool, and then afterwards, you essentially run a second tool and then do a scenario. So you show your startup path. And so this is at that initial time when you're compiling it. And there's actually there's a whole blog post written about it that describes how to use it. Um, so you don't have to memorize just these lines. But what it does is it rewrites that native image, and it moves all of the code that's needed at startup and all of the data that's in that file and puts it all together at the very beginning. And so although you still have the same amount of like virtual address space, your working set is smaller because you've paged in less. And so this first, Im this um, top one in blue is actually showing the exact same app startup and the amount of paging in and out that you have to do just to get that code and data that you need for startup because it's all over the file, right? And so by putting it at the front, you just have everything there. It's quicker to page in and then smaller working set. So the moral of this story for this one is if you're using NGEN, you absolutely want to use this as well. Um, if you're not already using NGEN, I'm happy to um, work with you offline and talk to you in more detail about how to kind of get started with that. But it's a pretty straightforward um, add-on if you are already using it. Um, oh, large object heap. So I was talking about the garbage collector before, and we talked about the fact that there's this Gen 0, and things start there, and then Gen 2, and when we do that, we compact. I mentioned very briefly, but so when we, when we collect, and we have, big little, we have lots of little chunks of memory that's there, we smush it all together so that you have a bigger space. One thing I did not mention is we have another heap which is your large object heap. And that's where anything that's larger than 85K, like an individual object that's that big, gets put kind of in its own special place. And it's like, OK, you are way too big to be moving around. And so this other heap, it goes there from the very beginning. It never goes into any of the other pieces that I talked about. And it goes just on this large object heap, which is what we call it. And so because these objects are so large, we've never compacted that heap. And we've made some improvements to it. So if you are already using the um, large object heap by using the, these larger objects, you may know that there's challenges in fragmentation and having wasted space and kind of these holes within the heap that weren't really well utilized. And so while we still don't compact um, for several reasons, um, we have massively changed our allocation. And I can give more details if you actually care about the large object heap later, but essentially we just better use those free open spaces and are better about finding objects that are small enough to fit into those spots and have smaller um, allocation. We also have improved the load balancing um, across the different processors um, if you're running on a server. So jumping to a very different piece than, than garbage collector, are there any meth users? 
Well, that sounds bad. Um, yeah, so we have a few. So for those of you that don't know, um, MEF, which is uh, Managed Extensibility Framework, is a model to be able to really componentize your app or if you have third-party pieces that nobody knows about and then compose it at runtime. And so you create what they're called parts and you simply either say that you import something or you export something. When it has typically been attribute based, those of you who use it know that. And then there's just a catalog that you end up in. And so at runtime, it says, oh, I import a logger. And then it looks in the catalog and finds something that exports a logger. And you can get more advanced and be more specific about exactly what you're looking at or which one you choose if there are multiple. But when it was designed, the thought was that there were going to be these components that knew nothing about each other and you wouldn't have any control to interact with them. So it's designed to be very resilient to anything happening and to be very attribute based so that you don't have to um, have any knowledge between the two. And so two things that have been added that are really interesting for that. One. So just a simple thing. So for those of you using MEF, um, you have the ability to turn on or off. So it's disable silent rejection, um, which oh, there's no picture, um, which just means that if you are looking for a part and it's not there, instead of being super resilient, it will actually tell you that it's not there and it's much easier to debug. The other thing is that we've added conventions, which follow the don't repeat yourself pattern. And instead of purely being attribute based, you can actually use the new registration builder and you can build up what that connection and what those different parts are without having to have attributes everywhere. Um, so if you're using MEF within an app, I see a few nods from, from the MEF people. If you're using it within your own app instead of a separate third party components, you will definitely want to look at this because it will simplify and clean up um, your use of that. Let's see, so a few other things. So one, I mentioned that engine images are really big. So just for context, the .NET framework engines everything so that it's fast to start up and you don't spend time um, jitting the framework itself. But something, um, when we looked at developing, where's that picture, ah, oh, the foot. Um, when we looked at Windows 8 and knowing that we're talking about targeting tablets and these smaller devices and don't worry, you can't read the little ones intentionally. And smaller hard drives. For the first time ever, we have to look at having smaller hard drives, not larger hard drives. And so we actually did a bunch of work to reduce the footprint of .NET. And we actually reduced it, so 4.5 four, on Windows 8 is actually 40% smaller than 4.0 on Win 7 without taking out any functionality. Um, and so we actually created this way where we have fewer engine images at the beginning and just the ones that like most apps use. And then we automatically will engine the other ones based on if your app on a specific user's machine, if your app uses it, they will end up getting the engine images for the framework components that you use without you having to do anything and without the user having to deal with a huge framework um, on their desktop. Let's see, let me pick one more. So a couple, of, so I have to fit portable libraries in, but I'll show you that one directly. Um, just a couple of things. So one, weak references. Have people used weak references? A few, okay. Weak references are also pretty awesome. So if you've ever had um, kind of one part of your app create an object, and that's kind of the one that gets to control whether that object is ready to be collected and whether it should stay alive, but then you have some other part of your app that just wants to interact and know information. And if you have a pointer to that object, you're holding on to it and preventing it from being collected and essentially creating a managed memory leak, which isn't very fun. And so we have weak references, and we've had weak references, which allow you to essentially have a pointer to an object without increasing the ref count so you don't hold on to that object. What we've added is we've added the generic version of it, so you can have a strongly typed pointer in kind of this weak model. And then the other thing that we've done is we've added 
a second way to kind of check that it's still there. So we've added try, get, target. I see a few nods from the people that raised their hands a minute ago. And so in this first way, you can just check, is it alive? By the time you get to it, since you don't get to control the life of this object, it can be gone. And so there's a race condition. And so what we've added is down here, this try, get, target, which temper temporarily puts a hard link to that object just during that use, and then it goes back to a weak reference so that it can be collected in a timely manner. One other thing that I will jump to and mention is that we added real zip APIs. So as you may know, we've had compression, um, we've had our own compression libraries, and there's been improvements to that as well, but they haven't been fully compatible. So we have a fully like true zip archive API, simple to use, and actually has the full zip compliant format that you would expect. So you can interact with it outside of your app and create true zip files. The last thing that I'll show you, instead of showing it to you in here, let's stop this and I'll just create one to give you an idea, are portable libraries. So if we add a new project, And we'll pick portable library. I won't name it since we're running short. Now, the benefit of this, so how many of you write apps for more than one platform, like desktop and Windows 8 and phone and web? Yeah, would you kind of like to be able to write at least the shared library code once? Um, so portable library allows you to do that. And what it does is typically you use like an MVV, um, MVVM model to do that. So you have full separation of your UI so that you can customize your UI portion for each platform and what it should look like in that environment. But all of that library code that's the same can be in one library, a portable library. And not only does it make sure that everything that you use and all the references that you use are will work on all of those platforms, but it's actually binary portable. So you compile it once and that same binary you can actually just drop into your different project, um, your different projects front ends and link that up and it'll just work. So you don't have to maintain multiple copies of it. And as you can see here, there's just really simple checkboxes that you can just pick, you know, what version that you want to target and once you've selected that, it will work on all of those platforms without having to work on versioning and any of that. It just works. Um, and so with that, we are just about finished. So if you have other questions about other features that I just touched on, I'm happy to chat afterwards. Otherwise, thank you very, very much for coming to an 8.30 a.m. session um, on the last day. Thank you.